Welcome to Value Through Vulnerability, a podcast dedicated to putting the human back into humanity. And this morning, I'm really excited to welcome Jenny Anderson. Morning, Jenny. Good morning. How are you? I am very well, thank you very much. And how are you this morning? Oh, pretty, pretty good. I'm in the middle of a mini break. The sun is shining and all is well. Oh, fantastic. So can, can you just, so where are you actually based, Jenny? Say so you're on a, on a mini break at the moment. Where, where's, where's home for you? What part of the world are you in right now? Well, I am actually at home. Um, home is a little village called Hascombe in Surrey. Um, I'm having a staycation break because um, I'm trying to get my house renovated. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm in between builders, paint brushes and all sorts of things. But it's quite fun to be do, uh, doing thinking and consulting for a couple of weeks. So I, I'm having fun, although I'm a little bit covered in paint. And plaster. Well, God, yeah, I, I don't envy you. I'm, I'm the worst DIY person on the planet. So uh, full respect to you, Jenny. <laughs> Well, I may be the second worst, but I'm giving it a go. Yeah. If it doesn't work, I can always bring the back in. Oh, I love it. Love it. Well, just, just before we get going, because I've introduced off to you by name, but do you want to give, give the listeners a bit of an overview as to sort of who you are, what your background is, what you're passionate about before we get going, Jenny? Yeah, sure. Um, gosh, potted history of Jenny. Um, I was born in Brixton in London. Um, uh, in the 60s. Um, so I was very lucky to grow up with a really multicultural environment around me, although, you know, as a child, you don't realise that you're lucky. But I think that was very formative in um, my views that, uh, you know, of looking at everybody as equal individuals, no matter what country they came from, race, religion, you know, we had lots of people from the Caribbean around us, the Windrush generation, we had people from Portugal. So it was a very mixed community. And I, I, I was very lucky to grow up with lots of different cultures and different types of people around me. And my second passion, I suppose, um, as a small child was nature and animals you know I a proverbial child that you know when I was asked what would you like for Christmas Jenny was a pony what would you like for your birthday a pony uh, and actually I never got a pony um, I had Twitchy the rabbit and borrowed cats from neighbors but mostly my interaction with nature as a child because um, my family was poor was being taken up onto Epsom Downs by my dad and laying on my back and having conversations with the sun and the grass, um, which might account for the fact that my eyesight's really bad now. Um, <laughs> but I had a deep connection um, to nature as well as to people. Um, so it, it's quite strange, but maybe not strange in a way that most of my career has led me towards communicating, communicating with people through brands, but also connection to an understanding of how important people's relationships are not just with people um, but also with nature um, and that's really the foundation of, of most of my work today oh wow that's I just find it really fascinating Jenny how, how like so succinctly you've sort of looked back at your, your childhood and just, and just seen how how much that defined you from a really young age to some extent and the work you do today that's amazing yeah, I think, I think when we're children, we don't, we just um, absorb things and understand things in, in, in a way that we lose as adults when we start post-rationalizing things. Um, but I, you know, I really am very grateful for the fact that I was born into what was a very poor family, we didn't have much, um, and into a you know an international community because it just imbued in me a very simple philosophy that uh, what you look for is is good people the good in people um, and so I never had to overcome uh, any uh, um, you know any prejudices from my early upbringing um, and, and I do when I when I look now and I'm working 
working with, whether it's executives or people um, in teams, uh, senior leadership teams. You know, I think that if you can come with a mindset that everybody's equal um, and equality is really very important and suspend judgment depending on what you see in front of you or not judge at all, that's a really good way to try to approach communication between people, teams, between organizations. Um, and I definitely track that back to, to, to doing that from my early childhood. Wow, that's, 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 that's really amazing. What, what, what I'm sensing from, from what you've described there as well, Jenny, is around this almost innate um, inclusion that you were brought up with. You know, we talk about inclusion as a topic that we have to educate people on, diversity, how do we stop people with their biases, etc. And what I'm sensing from you is it's, it's almost never been an issue because you've been brought up in this fully inclusive world to some extent. Well, yes, I think, I think my first... My first challenge in that whole area was almost when I went, uh, I went to um, a different school to do my A-levels. Mm -hmm. And um, from the one in which I did uh, my early exams. And there were a lot of girls there who were from what we would call at the time, Sloan Ranger backgrounds. And that was my first... <laughs> the first experience of understanding that I was common um, in inverted commas that that they that people judged others mm. on how they spoke on their background on how they dressed because that just simply wasn't the case in our uh, Brixton community growing up I think everybody was on a level playing field because there were you know nobody was particularly wealthy Everybody was working in, in a mixed community, trying to pull together um, it, a very old fashioned sense of community. So, so I was probably 18, 19 um, when I first experienced any form of discrimination. Um, and, and it was quite a shock. It, it, you know, it came as, as quite a surprise to me. And it, it, then I had a sudden, you know, rapid period of growing up um i i didn't go straight to university i went uh, i moved to switzerland and i was working in a swiss village called verpier which is a ski village um mm. a very wealthy ski village that was completely full of incredibly well educated and wealthy people um and that was when i first started to see the polarization of wealth distribution, um, the greater opportunity that was afforded to people because of uh, um, an accident of birth. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't feel resentful about that. I was just observing that it made a difference. And you know, even when in many, uh, many decades on, I was teaching at university, I, I was very passionate about supporting those young people who had got to university from what we would call um, a less advantaged background, who didn't have parents with a university degree to support them, who didn't have a network and who didn't have the confidence that you can quite easily acquire if you have a private school background, if your parents are established in business. And so I suppose I became a great supporter of, uh, of underdog dogs and uh and i feel that way in business too i want to work with organizations that want to open up opportunity and contribution to everyone in their organization rather than through a pure meritocracy and hierarchy uh that, that, that that's that speaks to my my personal values actually jenny as well so i actually do some volunteering as a governor and an enterprise advisor for a, a school down in dorset which is actually in one of the more would you say so, so, so oh, so sort of socially immobile areas, shall we say, and there's a lot of that, that challenge down yeah. there. But, but what's really powerful is you can see the power that you've described of community. You know, these are people that are not coming from, you know, politely the silver spoon, like you say, accident of birth, as you say. But it's incredible to see when you're not striving for the materialistic aspect of life, how people just connect naturally. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really agree with that, um, Gary, and it's really interesting that, you know, you also have a, 
a, a passionate interest in education um, because I, I do think we need in this country to take a really dramatic look at um, how we bring creativity, innovation, equality um, into our education even more than we do currently. Um, but I think that there are, that's one of the things I think that we have to strive to do. Socially, build communities around values other than uh, monetary values and, uh, um, and meritocracies. Meritocracies are important because they encourage everybody to do the best work that they can. But I think that we need to build communities around a different set of values and I see that working in villages and I see that working inside organizations and um, Patagonia is a great example it's often held up as a fantastic example of an environmental led organization but it's really very good also at uh, encouraging small communities of people within its organization to take on new ideas and new projects um, going into the food industry for example that came up through the creative idea stream that um, it operates inside Patagonia um, and employees are allowed to present creative ideas and given support to execute them if they're within the um, within the values of the brand um, and I think at community level too we're we're seeing that more and more where people are disaffected with, um, I don't want to say state-led regimes or politics, but that are coming together in community groups, whether they're CICs, um, to, to try to do things a little bit differently. You know, there are lots of food collectives popping up all over the country who are producing food in organic, um, um, you know, uh, agri, uh, a better agricultural system than the industrial one that we use and banding together to try to supply uh, small stores and farmers markets and use unused buildings, distribute food. Um, in a much more uh, collaborative and collective way. So, you know, I see these kind of things popping up all over the country in different industries. And, you know, I think ultimately that is what will change the business and social landscape rather than perhaps some of my day job, which is often trying to change the cultures of large established organizations. And I'm going off on many tangents here. <laughs> uh, so you have to interrupt me if I'm rambling on. You, you, you're not rambling at all, and, I've, and to, to be honest, there's, there's there's so many sort of questions I've got actually as well because there's this community set of values piece. I think if, if we can just hold the space for a second, Jenny, around just you and what you do as a business before we go into a bit more detail, because I really I do want to come back to your recent TED talk um, to chat about a couple of things. What you're what I'm sensing there around this community set of values almost leans into a little bit of this self management. I want to come back to that if we can. So in terms of who you are. So what is your business name and how can people reach out to you at this juncture before we carry on? Okay, so, so my business is called We Activate the Future and uh, what We Activate the Future does is work with organisations, whether they're startups, charities or multinational organisations, uh, to do a number of things. Um, primarily, we work with them to help them establish social and environmental purpose throughout the business. Um, and to do that, we often, not always, we often use the framework of the UN Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. as a template to analyze what the business is doing right now, what its opportunities are to improve its social and environmental impact. Um, sometimes we use other templates, but I I believe very strongly in the UN SDG or the global goals as they're known. Um, the second thing that we do often that falls out of establishing environmental and social purpose um, is very much around the culture of the organization because when you start to change a business from um, uh, perhaps a non-purpose-led organization to becoming purpose-led, a lot of change happens. Mm -hmm. um, so you have 
have to do what is known technically as cultural change management, but I like to think is just supporting people do the best job they can in a new environment. So we'll do a lot of work with senior leadership teams, um, with uh, all employees to help them understand how the new a new way of operating as a social and environmental the purpose-led organization is going to have an impact on the way in which they work um, the way in which they behave and what we try to help do is root out any uh, non-growth mindsets to help people really take advantage of the positive change that's coming throughout the, the company and the third thing that we do again which tends to fall out of the first two is that's very hard to do in a traditional strong hierarchical command control model so we do help organizations experiment with different business models uh, the most popular of which is self-management um, mm -hmm. so we help organizations design a container if you like an experimental container to allow them to try out test out incrementally um, implement self-managed business systems. And let's, if, if we took a, a retail organization, for example, like a fashion brand, that can be quite easy to do with a single store to, to run an experiment about how much more entrepreneurial, how much more creative, how much more autonomy you can allow a single retail unit to take and refine um, improve work on that and gradually stretch that out throughout the organization mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one of the things I find uh, the reason people don't often tend to go for it is it feels such a major uh, um, uh, transformation to try to achieve that people actually really struggle with knowing where to start um, uh, and and, and so we do a lot of work to help smaller organizations design those experimental containers and hold a space for them whilst they explore what it is going to really mean in a wider organization. So those three things, that's what we activate the future does. Um, I'd say 75% of our work is on the first uh, social and uh, environmental purpose. Um, um, and the rest of the work spread out between the two supporting um, pillars, if you like, of our work. Cool. Um, I don't have much hair, Jenny, as you well know, but it's, it's not an end listening to you talk right now because it just, you sound so beautifully aligned in what you do, really. It's just, it's really, really powerful hearing you describe so eloquently how those three parts of what you do connect so, so, so wonderfully. You know, there's all this talk about alignment in business. How do you align people's purpose with their organizational purpose? And I think, What's jumping out to me, and I'm yeah, re really quite excited to explore separately from this podcast, that point three with you, this experimentation, because people are scared of change, aren't they, you know, inherently. So, you know, yeah. that experiment is, is yeah. a really, really interesting angle. Well, I, I, I found myself um, that um, if I put an enormous project in front of me let's like take the renovation of my house mm -hmm. i can actually sit on my backside for a month looking at the plan of how many things that i've got to do and i can completely develop mind freeze and get absolutely nothing done so i i experiment on myself so within the context of the house i just think okay we're just going to work on a single room forget the whole house, let's just pick a room and we're going to work on that room and we're going to get started by doing the, the, the biggest thing. So I've got a container um, and the container is very, it's four walls and it's a, it's a room rather than a house with 10 rooms in it. Um, and I, it, it doesn't always work, but I found it is quite possible um, with self-management. If a company will give you an opportunity you can find an area in which you can experiment. So if I look at GlaxoSmithKline, for example, which we did some experimentation with last year, that is an enormous organization. Mm -hmm. um, but we worked with the division that is responsible for 
um, adapting code for new product launches within the um, enterprise management system that they run, which is a, an SAP system. Um, and we took uh, groups of their programmers and we were looking at um, how, how the organization could be more entrepreneurial and, sorry, that couldn't, couldn't actually speak that, but more <laughs> entrepreneurial and more innovative. And we ran a series of 90-minute uh, workshops, which we call um, uh, a Creative 90, to explore single questions with that, that group of people that would allow them to um, be uh, to, to express their own ideas, but to work with them in a design that would get us within 90 minutes to making a decision as to how they could go forward and appointing champions to run the project that emerged. Um, and, and that was really quite radical for an organization like GlaxoSmithKline to do. Um, and it did release quite a lot of energy within people, pro, senior programmers and junior programmers who had never before seen an opportunity for autonomy, an opportunity to have impact in their daily work and or to be able to question how their work was done because it's a very regulated industry and it has to be to keep people safe when, you, when you're mm -hmm. producing drugs. Um, but we managed to find a way to design opportunities for people to be creative, to have autonomy within uh, uh, and design enough safety into the process that the corporate integrity of GlaxoSmithKline would never be compromised. Um, so you can find ways if an organization is prepared to be brave and if the team supporting the organization is given enough time to understand Know, where the risk zones are and to design the container that contains those risks. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating for me, particularly using the example of GSK. Of course, you know, so my day job, um, as you know, is in the chemical industry, Jenny. And this, everything you're discussing yeah. is is highly, not only personal to me because I'm interested, but, you know, I can see on the horizon, you know, with exponential technology coming through, there's going to be more solar you know, the move rightly, as you're describing, away yeah. from reliant on fossil fuels to more sustainable technologies. I don't think, honestly, the chemical industry outside of BP is particularly looking at this stuff. And I'm just really intrigued, you know, without breaking any confidentiality. Have you seen anything in sort of big, you know, sort of big oil or sort of big power, you know, some of the old, old school, typical command and control heavy industries of the 20th century? Are you seeing any of, the, any of your messaging land with such organizations and again i'm not asking you to name names but have you had any sort of engagements with those sort of sort of sectors as yet jenny um i have um I, I, and i have to say it is difficult yes it is difficult because mm. their entire um existence is dependent on fossil fuels and a business model that was a very successful business model in the, the back end of the Industrial Revolution in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they are dealing with very large and unwieldy organizational models that are incredibly hard to change. Having said that, on the periphery of those in industries you are seeing a lot of really interesting innovation so if i take oil and gas as an example um there, there are companies for example that provide access platforms to uh, wind turbines and and uh, the oil and gas industry companies like ampleman for example which is a small um dutch company um uh, being smaller suppliers to that industry industry have more flexibility and opportunity to innovate and to take on a different level of shall we say corporate consciousness mm -hmm. so i am seeing it happen on the periphery of those large organizations within their supply base whether that will percolate upwards or not into the larger organizations i don't know the the other thing that the larger organizations struggle with is their, their, their organizational sh shape 
is inevitably tied into the finance and investment system yeah. that operates on a global level and it is not in the interest of mm -hmm. those organizations for the, that company kind of shape to change. Um, it's not in the interests of the senior management teams who are remunerated on short-term gains to transform an organization into a long-term change organization. So there are a number of very, very complex issues going on for the traditional sectors of oil and gas, uh, uh, agrichem, um, chemical industries. But there are some, uh, BASF, for example, um, you know, there are some very bright people inside BASF looking at green chemical, uh, um, you know, that I've met at sustainable brands conferences. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not easy for them. You know, they, the, the people inside those organizations that are championing change, um, you know, are operating in a, an environment that is always pushing back at them. So they have to be phenomenally resilient, mm. um, have great boundaries in place, um, and have huge strength of character to be able to carry those transformations, even in a minor branch of such large organisations. I think. No, I mean, no, thanks for that. It, that. That really resonates with me as well. And I think you know, you, you've touched. We had a bit of a, a funny exchange um, quite recently because I'd watched that that documentary, The Corporation, from a few years ago, and it's sort of a to, yeah. to, to, to realise that these these big unwieldy, as you use the term. Uh, Jenny, corporations are actually the equivalent of a, a medical psychopath was really quite a quite a hard revelation, something I'm still stomaching, to be honest, at the moment. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I think I, there were many years, uh, for many years, as I started out in business, I had a creative agency before I had Reactivate the Future, okay. and I swore there were certain companies I would never to work for and oil and gas are amongst them chemical companies are amongst them and I've now found myself working for all of them um, <laughs> in different ways and and that is a transformation that's happened inside me that coming back to where we started my very early experiences in Brixton is the realization that all of those companies are made up of people mm. and there are good people within those companies um, they, they just happen to have carved out a career in oil and gas or chemicals or drugs or uh, agricultural ag chem. Um, that, that's just how their, their, their life has transpired. Mm. And I believe all human beings can be touched by the plight of others and by the plight of the environment and the lovely blue dot planet that we live on. You just have to get a chance to put it in front of them. Um, and once that spark of awareness has arrived in, you know, even half a decent human being's brain, it's very hard to suppress it again. Mm. Um, now, the, the world that we live in keeps it suppressed very successfully. Um, you, know, you know, the Romans had an amazing strategy called bread and games to distract the mob. And it, it, it happens exactly the same way for us in the form of cheap food and Love Island and X Factor instead. So there are plenty of distractions <laughs> to stop people from experiencing that moment of awareness. But as with you, once it has happened, it's hard to take it back. It's hard to put Pandora back in the box. Um, so I... I am much less snotty, shall we say, about working with um, Dancing with the Devil these days because I feel I will never change a large organisation as one person, but I might change a few hearts and minds if I'm exposed to them for a short period of time. That will go on to create their own small change. Um, and, and that's what I hope for when it comes to the larger organisations. So I, I don't do it often but I do occasionally uh, dance with the devil, shall we say. No, I, I, that, that also resonates with me, Jake, because like you say, it, it's, your values and your purpose and your principles are very, very important, but there is still life to be led, isn't there? And it's sort of trying to, yeah, doing what you can yeah. with the time and the influence that you have. So no, that, that, that's, that's a really helpful actually reflection for me personally. So thank you for that. If we can move on to your TED Talk, because that is, obviously you've uh, done the very brave and I thought actually, you were deeply, deeply vulnerable 
Jenny, in your thing when you were standing in front of loads of people, you knew it was being filmed. I thought your ability to communicate, you know, where you feel you have weaknesses, where you want to improve, you know, how you want to push the greatness via the focus on those weaknesses. I just want to say here on this podcast, I've got the utmost respect for you and I was really, really impressed just by how, how vulnerable and how, yeah, how honest you are about who you are and how you want to make a difference in the world. And I just want to give you massive respect for that, which is absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, you know, it, I, vulnerability is something, is one of those subjects, and of course, you know, the, the, that's the, the title of your podcast, so it's good that we've come around to vulnerability. <laughs> um, it is one of those things that, that I, have, I have always struggled with. Um, I was brought up in a family culture that said, consider anything but don't cry. Um, oh, wow. uh, you know, yeah. never show we. Um, so, so I a, and I was a very resourceful and uh, adaptable child um, and a young adult. Um, so vulnerability came to me quite late. I'm a bit like Brené Brown in that way. I, I I had a struggle with vulnerability and I tried to beat it about, but it took a considerable amount of um, shall we say tests and trials for me to be able to understand that it was okay to fail and that it was okay to show weakness and even better it was actually okay to acknowledge your weaknesses um, because then you could work on them mm -hmm. um, and that took a series of different challenges happening in life um being diagnosed with terminal cancer which didn't turn out to be terminal um losing my farm in the winter floods of 2013-14 um you know so the universe kept going until i actually paid attention and started to focus on what vulnerability meant to me and what vulnerability means in the workplace mm. and i i Genuinely believe it's a very difficult, um, a difficult notion because, and and I, I, you know, everything I've learned, I've learned from Brené Brown, um, going on courses with her, and I, I would highly recommend that to anybody, who, whether they run their own business or they're inside an organisation. If you get a chance to do a couple of days' work with Brené Brown, grab it with both hands, mm -hmm. um, as I did, but. I think the key thing about vulnerability in any part of your life is knowing who, with whom and how much you can exhibit vulnerability. Otherwise, it's a bit like, you know, opening a vein and bleeding all over everybody. You can't do it that way. You've got to have your boundaries in place and be grounded in your own sense of values to be able to be vulnerable. And it's really hard, Gary. I don't know if you find it hard, but I find it very difficult. And one of the ways I learned to do it was through this making a decision to focus on weaknesses as well as strengths in my business. Mm. Um, you know, and having an open acknowledgement of what everybody's individual weaknesses were and creating an environment to support each other to work on them, as well as um, designing our roles around our actual strengths. Um, and that's helped me a great deal to not be, not overshare, not be over vulnerable, but to be comfortable being sh sh exhibiting vulnerability yeah oh, have i still got you jenny yes i'm oh, still sorry. here I'm, 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 i can sorry, lost your I, mind I, a little bit sorry okay yeah so, so, so we just so heard you saying around designing the roles around strengths Yeah, and that's, it, we, we design what people want to do, what they're good at, what their deep passions are, 
if you can design their role around their strengths at the same time as ensuring that they acknowledge their weaknesses and that we create opportunities for them to work on their weaknesses. Let's take um, public speaking. You know, most people in the world are terrified of public speaking. Um, and there are a number of people um, who work with me that are also terrified of public speaking. So uh, in our pairs, we make sure um, somebody who is really scared of public speaking has at least one opportunity a week to speak in public. Now, when that's first put in place, you can literally see them turn white as a sheet. Um, <laughs> but, but habit is an amazing thing. If you can actually do something you're scared of, free, frequently enough, ine inevitably the fear goes away. Um, and our minds are designed so that something that we are fearful of or that makes us feel vulnerable or that makes us feel exposed the longer we wait to do it the bigger and bigger and greater and greater and worse and worse it gets in our mind mm -hmm. so the objective of the, of the exercise is find your weaknesses really quickly and then practice them regularly and then it becomes a habit and habit takes the fear away. And that doesn't mean any, everybody's going to be the greatest public speaker in the world. The objective is just to take away the fear to make sure that as a person in business or in life, you can perform to the optimum that you can as a human being without fear. Oh, you, you, you're touching so many things for me. And I think yeah, <laughs> the first thing is around this strength space. I have, uh, I have a number of debates and really good some good healthy debates around strength-based sort of leadership and how I feel at times it does forget the weaknesses. Um, but I've had some good education from someone like Rob Baker quite recently, who's sort of very in line with your view actually, um, Jenny, around this, you know, being aware of your weaknesses and working on them, but still reinforcing your strengths is actually the combination, not this blase, get by, bring someone in to look after your weaknesses and you just worry about your strengths. I think there is a, that I, th I think there is a sort of nuance there for me. What, what about you? Yeah, you know, I, 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 there are these two schools of thoughts and I'm, you know, I try very hard not to be a binary person because mm. I have been very binary in my life and there's no right or wrong way. I don't think an organisation or a person should focus entirely on their strengths or entirely on their weaknesses um, I think there is as you say there's a there's a, a, a balance but what I find is naturally we will, will work on our strengths because yeah. uh, we all like to feel good about ourselves and we all like to improve something that we know we're good at and most of us nine out of ten of us will avoid working on our weaknesses like the plague because it's painful and we don't want to do it <laughs> so the way in which you can work on your weaknesses is by buddying up with someone else is a support system in place whether it's coaching or a buddy system or talking partners um, and in that way people are more likely to spend time working on their weaknesses as well as their strengths that's what works for me no that, that, that's lovely and just to come back I don't want to avoid the question you asked me a couple of minutes ago around how do I find being vulnerable now, for me, you know, the reason I started this podcast in the first place was so I've dealt a lot with my fears head on around sort of low self-worth, low self-esteem, these sort of things from, from many years ago. But I'm find, finding it super empowering um, to have a network, as you're describing, Jenny, of almost peer-to-peer -peer mentors. So I've got sort of seven or eight people in my world. None of them I work with. All of them I've met via Twitter and LinkedIn over the last sort of two years. And it's just, it's, to summarize, it's an incredibly giving world that we live in. And I think I've not realized that till the last two or three years that actually we are all connected. We actually do want to actually help each other. But we have we've been brought up on this system of isolation versus connection. And I coming back to where you started around your community and, you know, how, how you sort of do the work that you do. I find it very easy to be vulnerable now, but only because I've developed that muscle, to be honest, the last few years. It's, it's, it's like forming a new habit. It does take practice. And um, there, there was a really interesting event I went to um, recently organized by a lovely man called Charlie O'Malley. Don't know if you know no, him at all. 
Um, I'm making another, yet another contact through Sustainable Brands Conferences. And he organized an event and we're doing, a, a colleague and I are doing another one at Meaning Conference in November right. called Connected Conversations, which ironically is the name of my own podcast. Um, but it was a Connected Conversations <laughs> dinner. And it was a group of 26 people who agreed in pairs with, some, with a total stranger that we would have a three course dinner um, during which we would choose to discuss uh, um, three different questions with each course. And we had a little menu of three different questions for each, um, uh, each course to choose from. And they were all really quite deep, personal, probing questions. Um, and we, uh, we started the dinner by uh, holding eye contact and then milling around very much an art of hosting practice to try and find um, intuitively the right person that we would partner with for the dinner. And then we did, did the dinner um, and we talked about, um, you know, lots of different really deep personal things. So it was a way of getting to know a complete stranger being very exposed uh, in a Chatham house rules um, environment where you don't share anything at all about the conversation that you've had. And then we finished the evening in a circle. Now it was amazing. It was a really fantastic experience and a marvelous design to create that piece of psychological safety mm -hmm. um, for you to be, uh, you know, able to talk about some really deep and difficult things. Um, you know, and I got quite tearful at one point in time. I don't quite know how that happened. Um, but it was, it was okay to do that in that environment. I was talking about my, my very first horse going back to my childhood dreams that I, that I ever owned, who, uh, was called Tiggy, um, in answer to one of the questions. Um, and I, you know, I think it's something that might be really interesting to introduce into larger corporations where inevitably you don't know thousands of people you don't know everyone you work with um so that might be an interesting experiment that i'm going to attempt at some point in time on a large company that i work with but i haven't picked one yet <laughs> that does sound incredible do, do you want to give a when's that actually running at meaning so i'm going to be at meaning myself this year for the first time which i'm really excited about so when are you actually running that session what and what day is that and what time um well, it's not up on the board yet because um, the the lady who runs Meaning is away on holiday at the moment. Okay. So I don't think it will be going up on the board until um, she comes back from holiday. Um, but currently we're thinking of doing it at lunch on the Friday afterwards um, um, because the evening before is already pretty chock a block with lots of different events, but we might do it as a lunch on the day before so that there are a group of people who are complete strangers that are attending meaning conference. Who've had an opportunity to really connect on a deep level. We think that would be good, but we're waiting for Louise to decide which day would be best. Oh God, that's brilliant. Well, I'm running a self-awareness hackathon on the afternoon as a fringe event on the Wednesday. So selfishly, whichever one you decide, please let me be there. It sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, you'll be invited. You'll be invited. Lovely. I think you'll enjoy it. It was, it, it was uh, uncomfortable, but enjoyable. Oh, no, that, 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 that sounds absolutely amazing, to be honest. But look, um, I could speak to you all day. So let's try and get back, if I may, because I'm really, I'm really interested in the, just a, a couple of sort of questions around your TED Talk. Because one, one of, your okay. state, one of the uh, statements you made, which, which really resonated with me, when you were talking sort of second half of your talk, um, Jenny, around the sort of Carillion recent example of how corporations can go wrong, um, you spoke about the need for there to be more mature human needs discussed, sort of, you know, purpose, integrity within a sort of organizational setting. What that sort of said to me was around sort of moving from this parent-child to adult-adult relationship at work. Is that sort of what you were getting at? Or is that my interpretation? Um, no, not at all. You're quite right. Um, and, you know, I think, again, it comes back to organizational design is that most organizational design creates the parent-child relationship between 
uh, whether it's a brand consumer or uh, employee in hierarchy. Um, and one of the things that we struggle to do as human beings is have difficult conversations. Mm. We do many things that we can to avoid difficult conversations. Um, and one of the things that we need to put in place, uh, I think, in organizations is, um, you know, we train people to use software. We train people to speak in public. We train people to, but we never train people in how to have really difficult conversations um, where, you know, we are able as as psychologically developed adult human beings to have conversations about difficult subjects um, and that might be taking responsibility um, that that really has an impact on how we relate to each other and how the organization performs. Um, I remember talking to uh, I don't know if you know her wonderful woman called Helen Sanderson who's just launched an organization called yes, Wellbeing Teams. Absolutely amazing and lady. I, I know that she yeah that she experienced when she moved towards self-management a great difficulty um, uh, in not in not in sharing not in being vulnerable um, not in creating a person centered organization but in accountability um it because when we move to a much more humanized organization a much more culturally sensitive organization one of the things that we feel very uncomfortable with and step away from is accountability uh, whereas in a hierarchical organization your accountability comes at you like a train through your kpis which isn't particularly successful either but people find it very difficult to say, well, look, you haven't done what you said you were going to do. This is your, this is on your um, responsibility, uh, rotor, if you like, or however you design it, and you haven't stepped up. How are we going to deal with this? Um, and account discussions around accountability and performance in a, a positive culture are one of the things that people find very difficult. So they resort back to the old forms of hierarchy, um, a, a punitive hierarchy and performance um, KPIs. So I, I think that there is an enormous opportunity within organizations for people who can help individuals and leaders put in place a culture of being able to have difficult conversations. Um, so, you know, that's really what I was trying to put across in a very short 18 minutes that was packed with far too much information um, <laughs> with hindsight um, is it, where I think that there is an opportunity um, to really change the way that, you know, the future of work and our experience of work. Um, but, but that accountability piece is really tricky. Mm. I must say, Jenny, and again, it's only me speaking, but I don't think you packed too much in. It's an absolutely sensational talk, which I'm still learning from second time round. So really, is that, oh, good. Is a, absolutely brilliant. No, thank, thank you for feeding back on that. Um, I'd like just to touch on, because it's such a crucial part of your business. You mentioned 75% of it around helping you know, startups, charities and big organisations try and design around the sustainable development goals. This is something I'm only starting to sort of get my head around a bit. It's something I'm thinking about with regards to my organization in one of those more slow to, slow to change sectors. Which of those sustainable development goals, if you can answer this, I appreciate it's a difficult one. Are there certain goals that you're finding, regardless of size of organization, are more easy to adopt or get people more engaged quicker um, than other ones, just out of interest? That, that's a really good question um gary um i mean the beauty of the goals is there you know the interconnected nature of them all mm. um but undoubtedly there are some of them that are more relatable to if that's good english than than others and um the one you know often i do i'll do a very simple exercise when i'm first working with an organization and i did it the other evening in a talk 
um, which was just to ask people to look at all of the goals and say within their organization or within their neighborhood, what's the one that they see standing out the most that really requires action? And often that is inequality. Mm. Often that is the one that people will go to that, that if we could solve the issue of inequality, we would take gigantic steps forward across the board on many of the other different goals. Um, no hunger, no poverty, decent work, um, sustainable cities, life on land, life under water. Inequality uh, is one of the underpinning factors um, on the negative side of the you know of, of many of the other goals so that's one that comes up a great deal that people universally see as a massive challenge mm -hmm. um, whether and that can in a company form that can show up in a uh, pay gap uh, pay gaps between genders uh, pay gaps between senior leadership teams and people working on the ground uh, it can show up in a neighborhood between the number of million pound plus houses there are and people uh, in the same neighborhood having to use food banks. Um, so I think inequality is one. Mm. When you ask people, you know, if you could spend the rest of your life working on one thing, one goal, what would it be? You see a much wider spread um, uh, of goals that people are motivated by. Uh, a lot of people in a room will go to climate change, uh, and that's more about its prevalence as a subject for discussion. Uh, a lot of people will go to responsible consumption, um, and that is, again, often because they associate consumption with plastic, and plastic is a massive issue in media and consciousness at the moment. Um, so it will also, you know, the choice of goals will also be impacted by what's a, a national and global debate um, but I do think you know if, for example we take the future of food as a uh, as an issue that works across so many different goals um, uh, no poverty no hunger um, life on land life underwater um, you know these are all interconnected when we look at how we're going to design the future of food systems on the planet um, it connects to biodiversity loss deforestation um, economic opportunity for people in developing countries is often only around agriculture um, so so but I you know if I had to pick one goal I'd say inequality oh wow well, that's yeah and of course you said some really great examples you give of how that how that's showing up and thanks for sharing that because it's something I'm actually going to ponder on this afternoon as I reflect our chat, actually, is that sort of locale. You yeah, know, do. Ones are showing up. It's a you really know, the, helpful exercise. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, the, I, I, well, the global goals are a powerful framework for creativity, I think. Okay. Let's just have a look at that. So I think just to, just to wrap up then, Jenny, I'm just really interested to sort of, you know, you talked about this interconnectivity, and I think for me that's something that really speaks true from our discussion and i'd hope that people that have, that have listened to us today is that you know of course we've got individual lives to lead we have to put roofs over our head but how can we try and do more for others whilst doing what we do day by day and i think that really strikes it's really screaming out from our chat today is how can we get people to think a little bit broader than just what they do when they go home and they shut the door at 6 p.m in the evening well i you know, I think, again, that is about coming back to that idea of a container and redoing my house mm. is if I think about the whole house, I'll sit and do nothing. So we can be really frozen um, by all of the negativity that we see in the media. And, you know, we can think that the planet is going to hell in a hay cart and it, it may well be. Um, but if we think about it in those enormous scale and in those enormous terms um, it's very hard to take action as an individual it's very easy to become disheartened and think that there's absolutely nothing you can do um, so I think the first port of call is always to say you know what do I care about what 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 do I absolutely care about the most and it can be anything you know for me often it really comes down to nature 
And then, you know, what can I do in my locality? How does what I care about the most play out in my locality? And that can be uh, in my geographic location, my neighborhood, or I can see my locality as my place of work. Um, you know, and just pick one thing that you could do. But it, and it can be quite simple. And from a very simple thing, you know, like our Connected Conversations dinner, which there are now 10 happening in different places around the planet. And that's a small thing, 10 dinners, in one in Istanbul, one in Boston, um, one in Meaning, one's happened in London, one's going ahead in Amsterdam. Um, it's like little ripples um, that, that spread out. So I think, think about what you care about, think about how you see that showing up in your locality and choose to take a simple action. Um, and from that one thing, other things may grow. You don't know what they'll be. You don't have to be able to see a grand plan to save the planet, but you will be contributing and you will be making a difference. And if you think about 7 billion people on the planet, if only 1 billion people did that, you know, that's one seventh of the population of the world taking action and doing something to make the world a better place. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a big believer in grassroots act activation. I really am. No, what, what wonderful. I think just an absolutely beautiful way to, to finish our chat today, Jenny. So can you, can you please let listeners know how they can reach out to you, website, Twitter feed, etc. Um, because I'm sure people are going to want to be in touch with you. With yeah, little... absolutely. So www.weactivatethefuture.com. I've got a personal website, jenanderson.com, and it's a double S on jenanderson.com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at jenanderson1, um, and you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, and on Facebook, you'll find We Activate the Future it has its own page. Um, I have a, a feed, uh, which I think is Jenny Anderson UK. So hopefully one of those ways you'll be able to find me. And my email address is jenny at reactivatethefuture.com. Oh, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I'll, I'll attach all of these, all of your contact details to the show notes, Jenny, anyway. But uh, I just want to thank you so much for sparing, sparing an hour of your time while you're uh, at home on your projects. And uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting you face to face at Meaning. Well, I'm going to thank you, Gary, because I think I've lost you completely because oh, I, I can't we, hear you anymore. I got you back there. We had a little bit of a, a clip at the end, but no, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much, um, Gary, for inviting me on. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, and I think we've talked about a really wide range of topics. So let's hope your listeners um, find a few nuggets in there. I'm sure that they will. And look, have a fantastic uh, month off. Enjoy your time, and I'll see you in a in Brighton in November. Super. Thanks Cheers. very much, Gary. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.